Well, good morning, church. Are you ready to meet God in your scriptures this morning? That's about 18 of you. What about the rest of you? All right. But from time to time, I feel inclined to challenge you to respond because there's something about responding that aligns us with what's going on. And today, I don't want you to miss it. So everybody lock eyes with me for a second. You need what we're talking about today more than you know. But there is a good chance you won't remember some of the key things unless you take notes. I know because I'm a person just like you that sometimes I get into habits and I'll walk. Is that my mom? <laughs> Listen, I've just given up on a couple of things as a communicator. I can never compete with babies. They're just too cute. And I can't compete with phones because they're so enticing to me. My mind instantly goes there. So uh, the funniest thing ever that has happened to me as a, as a pastor is uh, years ago, and, and by the way, if you didn't get notes on the way in while I share this story, raise your hand. The ushers are going to come through. I really want everybody taking notes today. And honestly, the paper ones will be better than the digital because a big chunk of what you need today is only on the paper. It's not in the digital. So make sure you slip your hand up. But one of the funniest things that ever happened to me as a communicator is while I pastored it in a church in Florida, sure now I spent about five years in Florida. And as we were pastoring there, we were going through all the learning curves. Well, one of the the new pieces of technology to me in that era was a cell phone. And so I had gotten into the habit of taking my cell phone out of my pocket and putting it on the podium. And as I was coming near to the end of a big, heavy, full of conviction type of sermon where it was going to be filled with life change and, and just the excitement of all that, literally, as I was saying, and you need to say yes to Jesus today. If you're ready to say yes on the count of three, one, two, ring. It was awesome, like right on the podium. And so it wrecked me forever. So if you see me twitch when the phone goes off, it's because I, need, I still need therapy from that. So anyway, hey, this is going to be really good. We're in a series called Basics. And what we're really doing through the month of August is we're revisiting some of the basic elements of connecting with God. Because God built us for relationship. He didn't build us for rituals. He built us for relationship. Everyone say relationship. relationship. Relationships are, are started and maintained by things we do to connect together. And those essential connections are how the strongest relationships are built over a lifetime. And so, because God, our creator, is a spirit, he gave us that same spirit. We, he created us in his image as spirit and then gave us a body to live in and a soul to think and feel and make decisions with. And then all those things work together to relate with him who is our creator. But there are things we do together to maintain a strong relationship with God. The tendency over history has, and history has shown it, the tendency is over time we as humans tend to take those connecting expressions and, and let them begin to denigrate or just dissolve into empty rituals. And what we end up then is with a shell of religion, but there's no connection with God in it. And then we feel lost and confused like, I'm doing it, but it's not working. And I want you to know if you've ever felt that, I'm doing the stuff, Pastor Dave, but it's not working, the good, there's a good chance that some or all of these basic connecting points that God gave us, some, of, some or all of them have become more ritual than relational, and you're losing the life of that relationship. Thank you. I know because I was born on a Sunday in 1966, after my, aunt, my mom played the organ all Sunday morning long, she was a Pentecostal organ player. The funnest job in the whole church was the organ player in a Pentecostal church. So she played organ all morning long, and then after fried chicken lunch, I decided I'd had enough, and Sunday night I was born. As God is my witness, the next Sunday, I'm in church. I have probably could count on both hands the number of Sundays I've missed a church worship experience in 53 years of life. I'm, thank you. I'm not saying it to impress you. I'm trying to make a point. Is that 
as churched as my life is in its orientation, I find that the more of that expression I, I kind of autopilot into, the trickier this becomes because we become familiar with the connecting points and it's possible that they become so familiar they lose their essence. We're traveling back from a seminar we were in involved with this uh, this week and as we stopped, uh, we stopped, we needed some good wholesome food because we were tired of God's chicken which is Chick-fil-A and all the other stuff that they serve in conferences and so we thought, what's the hardiest thing you can get? And it's on the road, it's probably Cracker Barrel because, you know, they've got everything from stew to greens. And when you need a healthy connection with your stomach, you eat greens, like greens. <laughs> and you get them dry so you can put the hot sauce on them. Ooh, they're so good. I'm lost right now <laughs> in a big bowl of greens. Anyway, so we're, and, but literally across the next aisle, I saw a couple who had lost their essence. And you could tell because they were probably 10 or 15 or 20 years older than than I am, had probably been married their whole life and went through the whole whole dinner and she was talking, he was uh uh-huhing, but he was in his phone and completely gone. It's the saddest thing in the world when the things God gives us to connect with become empty rituals. And so the essence of our basic series, we are looking at the connecting things God gave us, which is worship. We talked about that last week. We talked about meeting God in his Bible. We talked about the essence of relationship. So week one was the essence of relationship that God created us to love us because he wants us and he chose us. Then we talked about how to connect with God in his Bible. And we used one of the basic uh, tools that we use at LifeLink Church. We went through the SOAP guide, S-O-A-P. If you missed either of those two sermons or the sermon that Pastor Cherie did on worship, I want to encourage you to go back on our app or on, uh, is it uh, Pastor James? Is it there on our app? Okay, I want to make sure it's on our app. I don't want to steer you wrong. All those sermons are available on the LifeLink app. If you don't have it, download it and go watch it. But the point is... The, the essential connection of this whole series is not about what are the basics so we can do them. It's what are the basics so we can connect. All right, so God gave us his Bible to connect with him in. He gave us instructions on worship because worship expressions help connect us. And today we're talking about communicating with God. Communicating with God. In a single word, communicating with God is called prayer. So if you just boil it down and say, what are the three basic ways God has given us to connect? Reading, him, reading the Bible, spending time in worship, and spending time in prayer. But if I just said, read your Bible, pray, and worship, we might go, oh yeah, I do that. And it's not working. And if that's the case, I want to encourage you to let God draw you back into a revived or a refresh or even a brand new understanding of what it means to not just read your Bible, but meet him in his Bible. Not just sing the songs, but connect with God in your spirit in worship. And as we're going to go through today, not just pray some words, but literally communicate with God. Make sense? So as we're going through this, let me give you a couple of uh, starting points Communicating with God is important because that's the essence of relationship. And I want you to listen to what God tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. It's there on your outline. Listen to this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation. Okay, let's just pause for a quick second. God is saying, instead of letting a disconnected state produce anxiety in you, Instead of that, in every circumstance of your life, in every situation, he's saying do this. By prayer, everyone say prayer. Prayer. And petition, say petition. The petition is basically a request. With what? Thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So he's saying, I want you to know in every situation, this is how you connect with God. You do it intentionally through prayer and thanksgiving 
is the conduit that opens that up so that you connect with God. Your requests are that is verbal expression. You're connecting and communicating with God. God, here's where I'm at. And let me just pause for a quick second. If you haven't studied this through, I want you to know the Bible is replete with context, but is very clear in single points that God is already full of, of knowing. The Bible gives him the, uh, the characteristic or that, uh, that he is, his attribute is omniscient. He is all-knowing, which means there's nothing we need he doesn't already know. So the issue is not God needs to be informed of something, as if you could hide something from God anyway, right? We can't. So the issue is not information. The issue of prayer instead of information is relation. God is saying, I want you to draw me in to your actual experience so that who I am comes into that experience that you're having and I begin to transform the situation you're in. But it's not an informational exchange, it's a relational connection. Y'all follow that? So, write this down. Oh, listen, let me finish this. Verse seven says, and the peace of God which transcends or goes above all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So God is saying, if you will connect with me in relationship and you maintain that relational connection through communication, prayer, if that's how you do that, then instead of living a life that's characterized by fear and anxiety and uncertainty and the things that, that provide all of the trigger points that then we cope through different mechanisms with, instead of that, something else will happen. So he said, instead of living disconnected with all those triggers going on, instead of that, if you'll connect with me relationally through prayer, and that's how you live in every situation. It's not really situation. <laughs> It just felt like it needed to be said that way. In every situation, I will be with you and something will happen inside of you. He says, and then the peace of God, which is not tied to your understanding, the peace of God, which is above your understanding, comes with him into our hearts and will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Why does God want to guard our hearts and minds? Because if we live unguarded, we will trigger destructively and fracture relationships or will enable bad habits that destroy our lives. If we live unguarded, devastating choices are the, just the natural flow of how we live. So he says, don't live that way, but I want you to do in every situation, I want you to bring me into it. So, <clears throat> Pastor Lonre, can I borrow you for a second? Your pulse just went up about 15 points, I can tell, because you have no idea. I, we didn't talk about this ahead of time. Okay, so hold tight. Let me give you a couple of fill-ins. Two things I want you to write down. God wants us to relate with him in our everyday life through prayer. God wants us to relate with him in our everyday life through prayer. And then communication is the essential part of relationship. That's communication is the second fill in. Okay. So in this, in this context today, you are God. It's better than being the devil because I think the last time you're up here, you represented the other side. So today I want to redeem that and let you be God. I'll be me. Okay. So stand a little bit closer because I'm inviting you in. Now, the context for this says, in essence, all right, let me hold your hand. Okay, now, we're connected. I'm, I could hug you, you know, I could fist bump or whatever, but just for the illustration, I want to illustrate connectedness. Now, God is saying, I want you to relate to everything you go through connected to me. All right, so now, just imagine the situations that you're going to go through connected to God. A conversation 
with your husband or wife. There's misunderstandings, there's old habits, there's patterns, there's all kinds of issues. And your mind is filled with history of how things always go, and we've been married for 30 years, and it's never going to change, or whatever, 17 years for you, or six months for you, or whatever that is, right? I'm just, I'm going to pick a couple of illustrations. This context, God was not kidding. He said, I want every situation for this to happen. So let's look. What does our instruction say? Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So I'm in a conversation with my wife. You're in a conversation with your spouse, your teenager, your four-month-old that's standing there defiantly looking at you, telling you no or whatever it is that that looks like in your world. In your mind, this is the pattern we go through. Now, God, you see what's going on. You see all the triggers in me. I feel vulnerable. I feel nervous. I feel angry. I feel threatened. I feel misunderstood. I feel this. I feel that. I'm telling you all the trigger feelings I'm having. So I'm not ignoring my trigger feelings. Got it? I'm pouring them out. Why? I'm connected to God. Now, let me ask you. Do you suppose he knows them already? He didn't need me to tell him that. Why do you suppose he's saying, I want you to pray about those circumstances? So that my eye, the focus of my heart, gets off of the situation and goes to him and says, God, this is what I'm facing. This is what I'm feeling. How do I respond? See it? Now I let him guide my my response because I've already been triggered. I want to say, what are you thinking about? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. You're an absolute disconnected from, I have no idea what your arguments are like, but I'm just saying, I'm just throwing words that might be common, all right? But instead of that, I'll say, now God, you see what she needs. You see where she's at. What What is helpful in this situation? And then I incline my ear and he begins to speak to me. And then I say, you know what? This is what I believe will be helpful in this situation. First of all, I need to repent. I apologize for being a bonehead. I apologize for, I don't know what you're, lazy. I apologize for for not taking out the trash. I apologize for being insensitive. I apologize for this. And by the way, let me just tell you, don't ever say, I'm sorry if that made you feel. I'm sorry you feel that way. That's not an apology. Got it? So the issue is, I'm sorry for what I did to contribute to what you're experiencing. Got it? Humility then opens grace, and then all of a sudden, wisdom from God begins to fill my mind, and I begin to say, what we're looking for here is the win. I own what I erred in. That's on me. I'm asking forgiveness. Do we, need to, do we need to give each other about five minutes to let some of the feelings drain? And if so, let's reconnect in 10 minutes and let's figure out what's the win. Do we need to go to counseling? Do we need to bring a coach in? Do we need to whatever that is? But I can only do that if I'm connected to God. Because if I'm not, watch this, if I'm not, stand over there just a little bit. If I'm not connected to God, then I feel like I've got to defend myself. I've got to guard my position, my integrity. I've got to guard my honor. You're not honoring me. You're not this. You're not that. I've got to, I've got to kind of bustle up inside and get blustery and get all whatever or whatever your, your reaction is. I've got to do all that to make sure you know. Why? Because I'm not connected. I'm floundering. But if I'm connected... First to him. Then the response comes back to me, guidance. Now my words have the possibility of being healing. Get it? Because what God wants in that issue is God is relational. Guess what he wants between me and in this case my wife? Relationship. 
So God's going to always go through the issues of his principles, and he'll say, repent. He'll say, forgive. He'll say, offer grace. He'll say, be kind. He's, he'll say, be loving. He'll say, tell her this. Tell him that. You know why? He wants her or him healed. He wants this relationship maintained. Got it? We can only do this if this is here. Okay, thank you, Pastor Landry. Y'all get it? Thank you. All right. So I just used one illustration, but that would be the same thing if I can just imagine Pastor Landry being up here. I'm uh, surfing the channels at night, and uh, my wife has already gone to bed. And there's a show that comes on, and I know that there's a lot less clothing on there that needs to be on a person's body. If he's not right here, I may linger a little too long. I'm just, I'm using common illustrations. If he's right here, it's like, ooh, keep going. Why? He's right here. Got it? When I'm going to a physics class in college, and I'm tempted to skip, or O-chemistry, or whatever that is, and I'm tempted to skip, I might be reminded by God, you need this. Stay right here. I got this. Do y'all see what I'm talking about? I'm trying not to be overly preachy today, because what I really want to do is facilitate an aha about what prayer is, because to so many people, prayer is empty syllables that get thrown at some deity idea somewhere, and the hope is if we, if we do it just right, it'll make him respond in a way that we want him to respond. That's not what prayer is. Prayer is that relational connection through communication. So if that if relationship-based prayer is not part of how you can understand prayer to be, then you're probably like the disciples that followed Jesus around when he was here in physical form. And it had dawned on them that he spent a lot of time in prayer. They watched him do extraordinary things by the Holy Spirit moving through his life. And at one point, they literally said, hey, can you teach us to pray too? So I was thinking about all the different uh, examples of prayer in Scripture, and they're all really good. But it dawned on me, if we're going to learn how to pray or get refreshed on how to pray, instead of the latest fad or the latest revelation or the latest insight or the latest in, uh, concept or the latest whatever it is, or some really cool stuff, some acronyms that you can use to remind yourself, to write, all this, it's all good. But I thought, why not go right to the source and let Jesus, who responded a certain way when his followers then asked him, can you teach us to pray? Why don't we let Jesus Teach us to pray. Sound good? All right, so let's take a look at this. Matthew chapter 6 is where we get this. It's the New Testament. And Jesus says, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think they'll be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. So what's he saying? He says, there's a group of people who resort to prayer, but to them, prayer are things they memorize and syllables they say in sequence together. And they recite certain declarations and certain patterns of speech that they associate with prayer. And they do them again and again and again and again and again as if that's going to make me aware of something and finally move my heart to intervene. And he's like, that's not, that's not what prayer is. That's not what prayer is. So he says, in this manner, verse 9, pray this. And I'm reading this out of the New King James. And one of the reasons why I'm using New King James and English Standard, some of these, is because for those of you that are familiar with the Lord's Prayer, we kind of learned it this way with some of that old English language in it. So that's the pattern that we're going to use for our, for our own familiarity. So let's, let's walk through this. He says, in this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven... Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Can you hear it running through your mind already? And that's okay if it's running through your mind because it means you've got a lot of the heavy lifting already done. So this is going to be easy for you. I just want you to know that. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. And because we are a highly monetized culture, debts in this context is actually the, the, the root word is actually means sin. So it's not financial obligations, although financial debt's not a good thing. But it's, he's actually talking about sin here. Forgive us our sins as we forgive our debtors or as we forgive, forgive those who've sinned against us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And uh, New King James includes this last phrase. Some of the new translations don't, but for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory uh, forever. Amen. All right. So I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but my, my suspicion is a pretty good percentage of us listening to the message today have heard these words. We're probably familiar. In fact, if I started, our Father who art in heaven, let's do it. Hallowed be your name. Your Okay, that's good enough. See, I see what I'm saying? It's in there. And so for many, to- for many, for many people, that overview is, yeah, I already know that. I say that 15 times a day, or I say that twice a day, or I say that once a day, or anytime I get in trouble, it's the only prayer I know, so I say that, because I've been taught that that's what Jesus said to pray. And literally, he actually gave us those words, but the context that he gave us those words are, is this. Remember what we talked about in verse 7. When you pray, don't use vain repetition as the heathens do, or in the same way people with Heathen is basically a group of people who don't have relationship with God. They don't live by their relationship with God. They live based on what they think in their own mind, what's, whatever suits them best. That's heathen. So he said, don't do what they do because they just use phrases put together and they repeat them over and over and over. So he says, I'm going to show you a pattern in prayer, but don't use this particular arrangement of words as if it is the way, if, as, if, as if it is the prayer. This is an approach, a concept, an understanding. But I want you to do this relationally. Y'all follow that? And I'm, I'm saying this again, please listen, because this may be like old news to you, and you're like, oh, our, our, listen, my prayer life is rich, Pastor Dave. Why are you dragging me through this? Because it's hidden for you. It's for the 99% of the rest of the people who actually struggle with the idea of what prayer really is in everyday life. Because whatever they think prayer is, isn't working like they think it should work. So I'm going to spend about the next 10 minutes walking through the Lord's Prayer, but not in the repetition mode. But I want to show you how this can be done in a relational mode. Okay, so that's what the, the next cup, the, if you'll open your, your notes up, you'll see this has been expanded. Everybody just open those up. You'll see now this has been expanded as phrases with context and pause points. All right, so when Jesus says, pray this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. I know there's a typo, but just it really means hallowed be your name, not hallowed by your name, but hallowed be your name. What you're saying is, Lord, I declare that your name is greater than any name on heaven and earth. And then one of the, one of the richest things you can ever do is actually rehearse some of the names he revealed himself to be because as God revealed himself in scripture by his names, he revealed characteristics of who he is. So it's not just a name, it's an essence of who he is. For example, the names of God, Yahweh, Shalom. Everyone say Shalom. Literally means God is my peace. We just read that a minute ago, that if we actually stay connected with God relationally in every situation and let him guide us, then what's he say? I'm going to guard your heart with peace that doesn't even make sense to your mind. I'm going to guard your heart with peace. What's he saying? Because that's who I am. I am Shalom. I am I am peace into that situation. Shema. And I've got the same. The way you've revealed yourself to be is higher than any circumstance I'll ever face. And then let your eyes listen back over that and say, yes, that's, that's who you are. You are 
Jireh, you're Yahweh Jireh, you're my provider. I'm, I'm reminded right now, God, you said you would always make provision for everything I need today. And then you'd pause and you'd listen and capture what's God say to you when you're at that spot. And don't rush on because the issue is not just getting the words out, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The context is, God, I'm reminded that your name is higher than any circumstance I'll ever be in. And right now, my soul is filled with anxiety because I feel so alone. But as I remember that your name is higher than my feelings, I remind myself that you are Yahweh Shema, that you're always here, which means even though I may feel like I'm alone, I'm not alone. And I don't have to act like I'm alone. I don't have to be afraid as if I'm alone because you're peace. Y'all see how that's so much different than going, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's relational. And then we sit right there for a minute and we let him speak to us because remember I was holding Pastor Lonnery by the hand and I was talking and then I waited for him to speak back you'll probably hear something like David it's actually true I'm right here beside you and I'm never going to leave you and then I would say God is telling me he's right here with me today and he's never going to leave me you know what I'm doing I'm capturing what he told me Tomorrow, it may, it may be an issue where I feel guilty over sin. And I remember that he says, I'm Sid Canoe. I'm your righteousness. Oh, thank God. Thank God I don't have to perform as if I'm the one that has to always be righteous. But Lord, your, your forgiveness gives me access through the blood of Jesus Christ to your righteousness. Thank you for putting that over my life. Thank you for being my, that God is my righteousness today. Why is it so important? Because your adversary is going to pound on your heart you're guilty, guilty, guilty. And you go, oh no, God told me right there. He's my righteousness. You see it? Capture the impressions that you sense God giving you. Then you say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What are you saying? Lord, I declare that your kingdom is coming and in, into and transforming. And here's different parts of our lives, my life, that your, your kingdom, not my ideas, but your kingdom is coming into my life and it's transforming me. It's transforming the life of my spouse. It's transforming the life of my children. Then I will tell you, let me just give you a quick, a quick um, kind of commercial break here for a second. I've had over the years, so many people say, Pastor Dave, I don't know how in the world I can pray longer than like 30 seconds. I'm out of words in 30 seconds. I want you to know, if you actually take this approach into prayer and you get relational with God, you let him talk to you and you work your way through each, each part of this, you're going to spend about two or three hours there. The issue is not getting syllables out so you can check that off list I prayed today. The issue is I got God in my life in these points and he's talking to me about it. Your spouse, your children, your family, your friends, employer, place of work, uh, schools, your church, your spiritual leaders. By the way, we need that so desperately. Your missionaries, our nation, the government officials, that your kingdom is coming, your will is being done, is transforming these things. God, I know it looks like a mess today, but I remind myself that you said to pray this, and so God, I declare in Jesus' name, your kingdom is coming into my life. It's transforming me. And then you sit there, and he'll probably give you an impression. David, I'm going to talk to you about your reluctance to accept responsibility for da 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 Ooh, okay, God, what are we saying? I want to show you how to take ownership of that issue. If you'll let me in there, I'll, I'm going to show you how to take ownership. Well, we're going to work this out together. Okay, God, thank you for transforming that part of my life because I need that. Do y'all see that? On and on and on. Then it says, give us today or this day our daily bread. This is where we say, God, I come boldly to you and ask for a fresh infilling of your presence and power. That you would speak to me. That, you, that you're working to align my actions with your words. I declare, Lord, that I'll manage the resources that you put in my life in the way that you direct in my Bible. I'm going to return your tithe in worship. I'm going to give as you guide. And that everything that, you, that, that I need, Lord, um, 
everything I have that, that you have, and that I have everything I need to be over, not under your circumstances. In other words, God, you're the one who's going to provide everything. I don't have to live under the tyranny of something that doesn't belong here. You can show me how to do that, how to get out from under that. And I'll step by step obey as we walk out of this. And then sit there and listen. And God will say, I don't know, stop ordering Coke at In-N-Out Burger. Just get water. I have no idea what he'll say, but I guarantee you he'll start giving you guidance. You know, turn off the cable. I didn't tell you to get that. Stop doing that. Yeah, but I, I, I just, I need, I mean, that 60 bucks or whatever it is, I have no idea what it is to go to a bar, in, you know, in today's c- currency and those kinds of things. But all, I need that money because that's how I, I uncork and I decompress and it's a hard life and it's all that. He said, no, 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 no. That 60 bucks actually goes over here. How you deal with that is with me. Do you see it? Yeah, but if I don't smoke that, I'll just lose my mind. Oh, no, you, no you, save that, save that, put that over here, and then you and I'll work that out. God can really get practical about what we put in our bodies and what we put on our bodies and we ride our bodies around in and was, oh, because he's going to provide for everything we need. But usually we get in trouble when we do things out from under his guidance and we just say, I want this and I need that, and if I don't have that, then I'm not cool like everybody else is. And So what if you have to have a flip phone? You won't pocket dial everybody that way. Y'all get the point? If we really get relational with God, he'll say, listen, you'll clear his throat and say, I didn't tell you to buy that. Well, I didn't want that. I just want you to provide for the monthly payment of it. That's not how this works. You signed that commitment. I didn't sign that commitment. Yeah, but I looked foolish if I look. Is that what you want? So God can get really practical about how he responds. But whatever he talks to us about, we write it down. We write it down. We capture what he's talking to. You know why? Because we're holding on to God and he's, we're pouring our hearts out and he's talking back to us. Forgive us our sins as we also have forgiven those who have sinned against us. This is where we get really down to the nitty gritty and say, God, I know I'm not perfect. I've sinned. I'm asking you to forgive me. But your word's pretty clear that your forgiveness is in some ways tied to my willingness to forgive others. So for for me to experience the power of forgiveness, you said I need to be forgiving. So God, who do I need to forgive today? And he'll say, Fred. Oh, no, not Fred. Anybody but Fred, because Fred is an absolute whatever your mind is going to say there. And God will say, nope, that's the one. Fred. Capture what he talks to you about. Next part. In the um, New King James says, lead us not into temptation. New Living Translation, which actually is a better way because God doesn't lead us into temptation in that context. But he says, don't let us yield to temptation, but deliver us from evil. So this is where we thank God that he has overcome all temptation for us and we put on the armor of God that's found in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. And this won't mean a whole lot because I'm going to have to pick up the pace just a little bit. But basically, when it says put on these things, that's a reflection of what God's telling us to put on his armor. That's the intentional application and obedience to the elements of instruction he gives us. For example, put on the belt of truth. Lord, I decide I'm going to pull my whole life together and base everything I'm choosing today on the truth of who you are and what you say in your scriptures I'm supposed to live by. Your truth is what I decide by. The breastplate of righteousness, Lord, I cover my soul with the fact that I am not perfect, never will be, but your righteousness is covering me. And when my adversary is hounding my soul and vexing me, I remind him that I'm under the righteousness of Christ that covers my soul. The pre- for shoes, the preparation of the gospel of peace. The idea that, Lord, my motive is to bring the good news of who you are to, of, to every person. And while I wrench at Walmart as an oil change technician, God, I'm looking for opportunities to make sure that people know who you are. Because every break I go through, I wipe my hands off and I walk in and I get my Coke. And I, and, but there's a person I walk by and I say, I want you to know Jesus loves you today. And, or whatever your world, I don't know what your world looks like, but the idea is the motive that I live by is I want to share your good news that you came to bring reconciliation, redemption to humanity. That's my juice. The shield of faith. 
Lord, I'm protected by trusting you that no matter what comes my way, I trust that you are the one who protects me. The helmet of salvation. Lord, in Jesus' name, I put my mind under the protection of the fact that I have been saved and redeemed. I don't have to live under the tyranny of old habits and old thoughts, but you are the one who gives me thoughts and direction. Remember holding on to Pastor Landry. You're the one who speaks, and when I hear your words, I decide based on those, those choices, not just what I think. Take up the sword of the Spirit. That's what we fight with. The sword of the Spirit is actually the Word of God, so we contend with dark thoughts in our minds by, by, by going to the Scripture and bringing out the sword of His Spirit, which means that here's what the Lord says about that issue, which is why I will not follow that, tempta- that tempting thought, or I will not go down the hole of, de- of discouragement and despondency today, or I will not just retaliate with venom in my voice because, you see what I'm saying? We, but we don't do it just because I said I'm not going to do it. We go, just like when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he said, it is written. Every time he was tempted, it is written. What was he doing? Bringing the power of the word of God the Father into that situation, saying, this is what the, my God says about that. And you pray protection around our family and our lives. And that we see that picture in Psalm chapter 91 and 23. And then we listen and say, God, what are, what are we talking about in here? And he'll say, I was going to talk to you about your motive. You're, you're not living with the motive of bringing the gospel to people. You're living with what do you think you want out of life. So let's talk a little bit about your, about your motives today. And it's like, oh, okay. Well, I don't, I don't know what that would be. But the idea is at the end of that, connect that phrase, instead of just saying the words, it's, Lord, what, what are you talking to me about? Write that down. And then the end, uh, in, in some of the early, uh, earliest translations, or the later translations, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory of, uh, forever. Amen. We're declaring that I live as a representative for the kingdom of God. I pray for an open heaven above this city and the region I live in. I pray for the lost of the, at the north, the south, the east, and the west will come into the kingdom of God and be saved. And we're just declaring the richness of the kingdom of God begins to manifest in our communities, in our cities, for his glory. And then we sit there listening and say, God, what are we saying about that? And he'll say, I want you to take that connection card they always put in the seats at LifeLink that you always sit on and ignore. Today, I want you to pick that up. Everyone pull at that card real quick. You know, it was on your seat or under your seat or something. He may say to you, I want you to take that card because I'm giving you an opportunity to connect with somebody today. And I want you to give them that and say, hey, Jesus wants you to know he loves you. And then we pass that out. What are we doing? We don't know where those, pieces, those people live, but we, we know that there may be a, a moment where they're in their spirit. They go, I've got to reconnect with God. And God will say, it's wrinkled up in your glove box because you threw it in there. So what was that card? Oh, yeah. Oh, there it is. Take that card with you. Pass that. What are you doing? I'm living to spread the gospel. Why? Because I'm an ambassador. I'm a representative of the kingdom of God. I have no idea what he'll talk to you about, but at each one of those phrases, we, we stop and we connect and say, God, what are you talking to me about? And then, you know what we've got? We've got an actual journal of God talking to us about what he's doing that day in our lives. You see it? So now when I get up from the place of prayer, I go, okay, I know what God's talking to me about. And then at Life Group, because you meet with other believers who are growing in godliness too, you bring your, your journal with you and say, hey, I feel like God talk, was talking to me about this week, I, every, every, three of the five days of this week, I feel like God was talking to me about unforgiveness. Y'all think God's talking to me about unforgiveness? Yeah, he's definitely talking. That's definitely God talking to you about unforgiveness. Or, or as opposed to, I think God's talking to me that I should be dating Cindy instead of, married, uh, instead of my wife who I've been married to for 13 years. You think God's talking about that? No, that's not God. That's just not, he doesn't violate his word. And all of a sudden, you know what you're doing? You're taking the impressions that you write down in that place of prayer and you're, you're growing in maturity of understanding how to recognize his voice, which is so important because Jesus said, my sheep hear my, my voice and they follow me. A voice of, the, uh, of another they will not follow. So this morning, I wanted to talk you through an approach to prayer that's relational, so basics. Again, it's different than our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's, Lord, today I remind you, your name is above every name. Today, Lord, I'm struggling with a sense of insecurity. I'm fearful about whatever it is. And I'm reminded your name is Yahweh Shalom, you're my peace. God, can we talk about that a little bit? David, 
I'm, I'm right there with you. And you're going to feel my peace today because as long as, you, long as you look at me, instead of your circumstances, you're going to feel my peace. Okay, God, write that down. Y'all see how that's different than just syllables after syllable after syllable after syllable? You know what we're doing? We're saying, God, I'm going to live connected to you. I'm going to live connected to you. You know what he said? Remember, he said this. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, which means it's not tied to the way you think. You're going, if you live this way, you will experience the peace of God that guards your heart and mind. So I just want to say that there's probably something God wants to do in your life, just like he wants to do in all of our lives in this season. So I want to encourage you to do this. I, I announced this earlier in the halfway point through the worship uh, journey this, this morning that we're going to spend a little time tonight in encounter as part of our prayer and worship service. But I'm specifically inviting you back because like sim in a similar the way that we did when Pastor Shree taught about worship, and then we spent about another 10 or 15 minutes in worship after that sermon. It's, it's kind of an experience lab. We're going to actually do something similar to that tonight. And I'm going to have these expanded guides with journal entries ready for you. And we're going to, we're going to worship God together. We're going to receive communion, a little time of ministry. If you need miracles, I promise you God's going to do miracles tonight. Whatever that looks like, whatever you need, bring it with you tonight. We're going to, we're going to minister to those things. Then we're going to actually, as a congregation, work through the Lord's Prayer in this fashion, giving each other time to hear what's God talking to me about. And you'll leave tonight with a conversation with God written out in your life. And I promise you, your life will never be the same. So come at 6.30. You guys get something out of this today? <laughs> Basics. Basics. Let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your goodness. You're so powerful. You're so practical. You're so present, God. All these things just blow our mind. And today, we're so thankful for that. God, thank you that you didn't decide you wanted just a bunch of robots doing religious looking things that instead Lord what you really want is a relationship with people that you created and that's us and today we sense and feel you drawing us into that place so God you have our yes today I want to pray for every one of you with your heads bowed and your eyes closed and you feel like God is saying I want a new season with you I want a, a fresh new start with you I want a, a fresh start with your Lord with, as, a, as the Lord of your life and I want you to to make a decision today that no matter what's happened in your past or what you're afraid about in the future even though you don't understand everything you want to say yes to my my Godship in your life today as a fresh start. There are some people in here with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. You know this is your day. So in the count of three, in about 30 seconds, I'm going to pray a prayer and give your lips something to say that your heart's already saying, but I'm going to do this in a way that you're going to love. So on the count of three, ready? One, this isn't confusing. You already know who you are. Two, I'm not going to embarrass you and ask you to stand and come to the front or in any way. But when I say three, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand up and leave it up until I finish counting so I can connect with you and we can pray together. Ready? If you're ready to say yes to Jesus today in a life-changing way, then three. Lift your hand up right now. Leave it up just for a moment. Please don't be shy. Don't be shy. Nobody's looking around. This is just me counting. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Who else? Did I miss anybody? Nine. Okay, you can put your hands down. Hey, guys, everyone, let's just pray this together from the bottom of your heart, and let's all pray out loud. Heavenly Father, come on, everyone. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me enough to teach me the truth in your powerful scripture. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross to pay for every sin in my life. I'm asking you to wash me, cleanse me, and forgive me for every sin I've ever committed. I'm inviting you to come into my heart, the core, the soul, the bottom of who I am, and be my God and lead my life from this day forward as my only Savior and Lord in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Come on, you guys. Let's give the Lord some thanks today. Thank you for watching the LifeLink Church video podcast. It is our prayer that you heard a word from God today. If you have a story to share about how God is working in your life, then let us know and send us an email at mystory at lifelinkchurch.com. 